beyond today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Red Shades, a stage name she developed from a pair of red sunglasses her aunt bought for her as a child. Is a woman of countless talents. Red represents her aura and the passion she has for all of her pursuits. Shades intertwines her nickname and symbolize her vision of the world, as well as her point of view behind her sunglasses. The Boston native powerhouse with roots in Macon, Georgia, is a Boston Music Award winning hip hop artist, professional video producer, public speaker, educator, and youth mentor. Red's undeniable talent and electric personality have been widely praised by both local and national media, such as MTV, NPR Music, the Boston Globe, and more. Understanding education is important at all levels. She is a 2014 graduate of our very own Fitchburg State University. Red is also the founder of Music Jumpstart, which aims to educate aspiring artists and creators on how to jumpstart their careers and turn them into businesses. Her latest album, Feel the Aura, is available on all digital streaming platforms and for sale at chillinintheshade.com. Let's bring to the stage or to the camera, to the virtual platform, our very own Red Shade. Hi, everybody. How are you? I am so excited to be here and present to you from artist to entrepreneur and specifically how my family that I met at Fitchburg, which is friends and family, um, became my secret to success. So without further ado, I'm going to present and I hope you guys enjoy my story. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Cool. So right here, you know, this picture says a thousand words to me. So this is how I decided to start my story. A lot of these people in this picture, everybody is from FSU. I met them here and they have become my lifelong friends. Um, it's, it's actually so surreal to, to see that we've come this far. This is almost 10 years ago and we all met here in Holmes Dining Hall, um, which a lot of us call DACA. So you might hear me refer to it as that. I'm sorry in advance. Um, but I really had to center this talk around them because they were really the people alongside my, my family, my father, um, more specifically, who pushed me to become Red Shades and, and who the world now knows me to be. Um, growing up, I was like, I have still to this day, like a lot of social anxiety. I stay closed in, reserved into myself um, for whatever reasons, which I'm about to share with you now, uh, somebody like spread word that I do music. And once one person heard it, it spread and now everybody knows. So. You know, this is what I want to talk about. And we have to start at the beginning. So in 1990, I was born, I'm a proud Libra. Uh, I was born September 26 in 1992. Young parents, my parents were 17 years old. They had no guidebook to life. They just, they just did the best that they can. And so as we talk about the black family representation, identity and all of that, my mom always instilled in me you know, I do not want to be a statistic. You know, my child is going to excel. Um, she is going to know how to read, write. Um, so education was very important. Um, and this is something that a lot of black people can relate to just from, you know, times before, even before slavery and during it, you know, reading and writing was, was kept away from us. So now in the more recent generations, education is something that is constantly pushed 
in our family. So my mom was not going to have it any other way. Neither was my dad. Um, so it was growing up, it was all about defying the odds, black excellence. Um, and just also, there was a lot about how you should carry yourself. There was a lot of gender roles. You know, today we know a lot about being gender non-binary, gender non-conforming. Um, but back then it was like, you're a lady, so you should act this way, you know? So growing up, I feel like I really didn't know who I was yet until I got to Fitchburg State, but we'll get into that later. So I just had to follow what was taught to me. Um, everything had to be perfect. And that's something that ended up haunting me as I got older, which I can proudly say that I embrace imperfection today in this current day. But growing up, I always felt like I had to be perfect. I had a lot um, on my shoulders because being a failure was not an option in a black family because we've already, we've already been through so much. So those are some of the themes and some of the, you know, the things that were instilled in me early on in life. Um, like I said, like growing up, I was, I was a loner. I was an only child. Um, and I had to make believe with all my stuffed animals, my dolls, um, my cousins. I have a big family because, you know, my mom's side was West Indian and the other side from the South, um, Macon, Georgia, like Christopher mentioned. And then my dad's side, for the most part, are all from up North, up here. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it, I had my own room and it was just me. So I had a vast imagination and I had to make believe a lot of things. And one of those things would be um, having classrooms. I would put all my dolls, my teddy bears in there and I would give them little grading papers. I would grade their work and it was me writing on the papers the whole time. But I, I don't know, I was so captivated by being an educator that I would just do what I saw my teachers doing back then. Um, and so I realized that I was so self-aware because I was a loner. Um, I didn't really need too many people to be creative. I think creativity blossomed due to me being alone a lot of the time. So, you know, my parents were very present in my life and they were like super supportive when they saw that I took a liking to music. So I've had guitars, keyboards, um, you know, easy bake oven, you name it, whatever, like cameras, they bought me camcorders. And I never forget being um, presented with equipment to like record uh, my early songs. And I was like trying to audio engineer it was just my room was a production studio. And looking at my apartment today, it's the same exact thing. So parents out there, support your kids' dreams. You never know what they'll do with it. Um, I'm sure nobody ever knew that I would do it this long, but I'm glad that I never stopped. Uh, but that's a little bit about who I am. So as we get deeper into Red Shades, you're going to learn that this is sort of a persona for me. This is a, I keep all those personalities separate because to me, it, I was stepping into a whole other world. So who I am when I'm Red Shades is not who I am when I'm Shalea Washington. And my family nickname is Shay Shay. So Shay Shay doesn't know anything about who this Red Shades character is. But when I put those glasses on, I felt like I was on top of the world and I just felt like I could conquer it all. Um, and, and, We'll get into this, but Red Shades, I've been going by that name since I was 11 years old. So this is like, this is not new. And a lot of people that just find out about me, they're like, oh yeah, how'd you get that name? Um, so just going in a little bit more about what I was into when I was, even when I was younger, I mentioned the education, music, obviously. And so depending on if you've read any articles about me, I often credit my dad for you know the love of hip hop, but I wanna also credit my mom because growing up she had like this very vast music collection. I remember us um, having this living room with cases and cases filled with physical CDs back when people used to buy music. And there was everything from reggae, dancehall, 80s music, rap, um, neo soul, of course, and R&B so much that those became like my favorite genres, R&B and Neo Soul are like my favorite. 
And then my mom and I shared this bond of watching a lot of movies together, whether it was rom-com, comedy, drama, whatever, what, what have you. Um, we watched a lot of that. And I always realized that, hey, I am I was always interested. Every time the movie would end, people would move on about their business. And I'm sitting there wanting to watch the special features. How did it come about? Who are the actors, the script? And so when we, you know, DVDs, when DVDs were a thing, I would always go and pop in the special features first. So around like high school, my father realized like, you know, do you, do you want to be an actress? Like, is it, is it the camera? Do you want to be a camera operator? I didn't know at the time. I just know I love the set. So I had every intention. I knew that when I went to college, I was going to apply for the film department. And there's a whole st story behind that too. I want to give a big shout out to Randy Howe uh, when I get to that story. But um, I always was a motivational speaker. So this public speaking, I just feel like I have this talent to help other people find their niche and let them see you know, what they're good at. And then also I took upon uh, online radio, which is now known as podcasting. I had my own online virtual show um, over 10 years ago. And that's how I met some of my very first fans. Now, keep this in mind. Some of the, you know, repeated themes are, you know, being a loner and just everything happening inside of this room, which you'll be able to see a peek of what that looked like um, in the next slide. But um, I did all this creativity out of this one room in Rhode Island for like 11 years of my life. And it really helped mold me into who I am today. And I'm forever grateful for it. Um, so as we talk about my dad, just to give you a little background insight, he was in a rap group when I was younger um, called Killenfield. And when I was five, about five to eight years old, you know, I got to witness him performing at concerts, opening up for Rakim. Uh, guerrilla marketing, because, you know, back then the, the industry was different. Like when my dad was pursuing his rap career, the only option you had was to go try to shop a deal, you know, at record labels. Being independent, there was no such thing because um, everybody wanted to reach like that higher peak, you know? So I saw them like posting pictures and posters on pay phones. Um, when those were a thing, this is dating me here, but like then, you know, studio sessions, I'm, I'm realizing I'm looking at them. They're bringing singers in. There's, you know, musicians, guitarists. And I'm like, you know, what is this? So I, like early on, I became like captivated by the whole hip hop culture and I wanted to emulate my father. So pretty much what I saw him doing, I started doing it. So I'm just going to show you a little bit in this clip. Um, the the audio is a little bit hard to hear, but I just want to show you some of his mannerisms and showing him on the stage. And then you'll see how he sort of just handed me the torch. And now I do this exact same thing. And he sort of he became like my my advisor, if you will, my agent. Like I don't make any big decisions without consulting him because of that love and the passion that we share for hip hop. So here's a little bit of it. Here, so that was in. I can't even tell you what club that that that. Sorry, I can't even tell you what club that that was in back then. Um. But it was some club in the 90s in Boston. Maybe somebody here may know, um, but I don't. But just talking about it, you know, growing up, I was always a little hip hop B-girl. So you can see me and my father right here. This is on Calumet Street in Mission Hill. Um, I grew up in Roxbury, born and raised. Um, and so, you know, I remember one summer, as I mentioned, I have roots in Macon, Georgia. Shout out to all my family down there. I used to spend every summer there and I also lived there for a short stint. Um, one day, I remember taking all my dad's albums, mixtapes, right? And I made it a point to memorize 
all his lyrics. I wanted to show him how serious I was about becoming an artist. And back then, I don't even know like, you know, what my what my dreams were. I just knew, I was like, I seen him doing it. I want to do it too. I feel like I could be a star. You know, one thing I miss about myself at that time is how fearless I was because how shy I am now, I, I don't remember that being a problem back then. I was like, yeah, I want to get on stage. And I, I just wanted to show him like, you rap, I I can rap too. And so he used to laugh, but he, he would support me. But you know, obviously I didn't really have much to talk about at six and seven years old. So when I memorized his lyrics, I called him from Georgia and I was like, daddy, um, I want you to hear something. And he's like, okay. And I never forget, I, I gave him, I spit three verses from three of the songs that he was on. And he was like, wow. You know, he was like, the fact that you can memorize all that at a young age, these aren't even your lyrics. He's like, that's dope. He said, keep practicing, you know, start writing some of your own stuff. He always like encouraged me. And so, you know, now we're going to switch into a few years later when I was like a teen, I was like 18. This is like pre Fitchburg, right? We're almost getting there. Um, and he took me to record one of my early, early projects. I was so shy. You're going to be able to see that a little bit on this video. Um, he took me to Cyber Sound and this is located in Copley Square in Boston for those that are familiar with the city. And I'll never forget this day. And it, it really set the tone for how I record now. So I just want to share that with everybody. What's up, man? You ready to do your thing thing? Yeah, we're ready. We're about to record two hits right now. All right. We're going to keep striving, and we're recording um, Try So Hard, and we might do Keep It Moving. All right, cool. <laughs> And so that was one of like my favorite moments because that's my first time really feeling like an artist. Um, I really, I had to get a lot of um, pep talk from my dad, which is a fun fact on all of my projects. I have a skit called Pep Talk. They all feature my father because that's real. He would give me these sort of pep talks when I wouldn't feel my best self like I was my highest self, if I was unsure about something, I always would call him first and he would give me pep talks. So on my very first mixtape that I actually released the day I started my first semester at Fitchburg, that's another fun fact, he's on pep talk one. On my, my very debut album, um, Magnetic Aura, he's on pep talk two. And then on my recent project, Feel the Aura, 
he's the pep talk three. So he's going to be on all of them. That's like a, uh, theme that you're always going to see on there because I just like to be very vulnerable, authentic, and bring everybody into my story. I'm very like private when it comes to social media. So my art is my chance to like thoroughly articulate myself and just be honest about some of the things that are going on. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed, enjoyed that. Um, and, and now I know for some people you're probably wondering, but why red shades? And Christopher kind of went into that briefly, but a lot of people go, all right, why is it ain't red shades, why it ain't blue shades? You know, a lot of people joke and call me, you know, purple shades and all this stuff. But um, when we're talking about family again, I'm, I'm just, not that I'm just realizing it, but, you know, it's because of my family why all these things came to be. And so my aunt was babysitting me one day and she told me that I was being good. And we went to hair stop um, on High Park Ave for those that are familiar with Boston. And in the hair store, if for anybody that's familiar with like beauty supply stores in the hood, um, at the front, they sell a lot of things that have nothing to do with hair. So you can get some, some earrings, you can get glasses, um, whatever, whatever they decide to sell up at the front. And so my, my aunt was like, you can pick whatever you want. Um, you can have it there. So I'm looking around and, um, I don't know. I fell in love, man. I looked in that, that front thing and I seen glasses. They almost look just like these on the screen. And I was like, Oh, I've, I've never seen, you know, red glasses at the time I was only 11. So I, you know, they were out already, but I never seen any. So those, like attracted, I was attracted to those and I put them on and she's like, this is what you want, you sure? And I'm like, yeah. So I put them on, again, being an only child, as soon as I got home, um, I added this new artist to the roster. Um, I used to spend a lot of time on um, karaoke machines. So how I mentioned my parents bought me whatever I wanted, uh, alongside the keyboards and all the other instruments, they bought me this karaoke machine. It was over once they gave me that because I was making all of my early mixtapes on there. Um, you know, now today it's easily like music uh, working stations are easily accessible. We didn't have that back when I was coming up. So having that karaoke machine was everything to me. So you would have to put in a cassette tape on one side uh, that had the beat put in a blank cassette tape, press play and record, the play and stop to record it. Um, and then you can make your little mixtape there. And that's what I was doing. So again, because I didn't have much subject matter, I was copying a lot of the things that my dad and his group member were saying. So I was rapping a lot about the streets, things I had that I couldn't relate to. Um, but you couldn't tell me nothing. I thought I was the freshest thing walking. So I added this new member named Red Shades to my label. And for some reason, out of all the other fake names and, and artists that I made up, Red Shade stuck with me. And I, I feel like it's because it incorporates my nickname. Like I said, my, my name's Shalea, family nickname is Shay Shay. A lot of people call me Shay. Um, so I put in Red Shade. So back then, the name to me was nothing more than, you know, an alternate, an alias. But as I started to grow into myself and actually figure out who I was, red represents the fire and the passion and my aura um, that I put into everything, all the passion that I put into everything that I do. And then shades sh sort of represents this mysteriousness, this mystique um, and my, my view of the world behind these sort of like rose tinted glasses, if you will. It's a lot of play on words, but basically it's my perspective. So for people that are familiar with my music, I do a lot of storytelling. I'm very vulnerable or I'll, I have versatile music, but at my core, I think we call it when I'm in my bag, it's when I'm doing like the storytelling. And that's what I feel like um, when I put these red shades on. Another thing to combat my social anxiety is what I do when I put these glasses on, I'm realizing like every time I go and I'm about to perform, I do this sort of ritual. I didn't even know it was a ritual until um, people pointed it out. But every time when, you know, at the House of Blues, the Sinclair, all these places I perform, you know, we're back there, all the talent on the bill is hanging out in the green room. 
and I'm I'm having a good time. I usually don't eat too much before a show. And before you know it, this always happens. I'm sitting down and I'm not saying anything. And I have on a blank face and people start going, Red, are you okay? What's going on? What's happening? I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. I don't like to do too much talking. It's not because I'm a diva. It's because literally I'm telling myself, all right, you're almost up. You're about, like, get on there and kill it. Stop being scared. All the while, my my chest is pumping. I feel like my heart's about to come out my chest. My heart's dropping. It's like a really crazy experience. So if I don't do that ritual, I can't really go out there and be the performer that people know me to be. But um, before we get into that, I, I'm not going to show this whole video. But the room that I referenced earlier in my Rhode Island home, this is where all the magic happened. Like literally, um, so back there I see some of like my old pictures on the wall, but I used to have this computer with Fruity Loops on it, which is a software that you can make beats on. Um, I used to produce when I was younger as well, but literally in this corner that you see is where all the magic took place. So I'm gonna, you know, YouTube was a big uh, platform at the time. And so, that's kind of where how you see some of these influencers, I think that's what they call them now on Instagram and, and on TikTok. YouTube was the place to be. Back then YouTube had like discussion boards, everybody communicated with each other. And my parents used to, um, you know, make fun that a lot, most of my friends were from online as opposed to in school. Cause for anybody that can um, empathize with being an introvert, it's kind of hard for us to, you know, make friends like, I guess, you know, in person. Now, mind you, I do want to say I am a people person, a people person, oddly enough, but I do retreat a lot. So online and YouTube is where I found my friends. And I'm just going to share a quick verse that I did um, to a diplomat's beat um, when I was 16. <laughs> Kill feel affiliated, shades of reproduction. Let's go. Yeah. When they ask you all my skills, hot as they better you hate on me cause I'm ill and I bring a lot of energy. Not rapping about the real or sipping on some Hennessy. You know I keep it real, so you wanna know my recipe. You never do a bill, a style that's incredible. Imitating and duplicated, just to get next to me. Let it keep it chill, I'll probably get the step of G. Highly great and anticipated and you can settle me. Get your eye in, there's no denying we set. So that's just a little bit um, of that. I just wanted to show you that corner where everything sort of took place. So now we get to the fun part, which is Fishburg State University, which I want to say that when I joined uh, the campus, it was Fitchburg State College at the time. I actually remember when we got a memo sent out saying, um, that, so, you know what, this is Fishburg State University now, call it FSU. I was like, oh, okay. Um, but what is very special about this moment for me is I, I didn't start in the fall like my peers did. So I had sort of like six months to sort of really like hone my craft at home. Um, I really didn't have a college experience yet. And I remember to my knowledge, I was supposed to be going to Suffolk University, but that wasn't in my cards and it wasn't in my alignment. It was meant for me to go to Fitchburg State University and that's what happened. So I remember having to take um, a placement exam um, and I, I saw the new atmosphere. Fitchburg State did not look like what it looks now because when I when I ended up graduating, I was like, wow, this is not what it looked like in 2010. So there's a lot of upgrades, lots of improvements. But Fitchburg, the, the campus was like in the middle of the neighborhood of Fitchburg. So back then you couldn't really distinguish the campus from the town. And so because of that, we met a lot of locals um, and things of that nature. So I was really just trying to get used to this new place. I'm a, you know, I grew up a city girl and, and Southern girl as well. And so it was just all new to me because this was going to be the first time that I was on my own, you know? So it was just, 
it was a lot of emotions, um, overwhelming emotions. So my dad took me up. It was like a cold day in January. We had on winter coats. I had to take my placement exam. And I remember I ended up passing with flying colors and I had to like pick some classes. And I went to the library at the time. At, I don't know if it's still called Hammond, the Hammond building. And I met who is now one of my closest friends. And um, I'm actually the godmother of her children. My And she, be, she was my room. She became my roommate. She was in there. She was like, um, my only advice to you is not to take any McKay classes because that building is so far away and you don't want to walk all the way down there. I was like, thank you. Um, and so that was like my first friend that I was able to meet. Uh, but I ended up, there was like this program called Mount Wachusett. So she wasn't fully in FSU as of yet. And so I didn't see her that often once I, once I started. So when I first got to Fitchburg, uh, they put me in, I think it was a forced triple, but I was sort of in a suite in Aubuchon. And I want to give a major shout out to Alita, my roommate, um, Maggiani and Brianna. They, I'm trying to remember how they found out about my music, but I think when I went in, as I mentioned, my mixtape dropped that day, the day I started. So she caught wind of that and she was like, oh, you know, let me hear it. And knowing myself, that's around the time I started getting really shy and suffering from social anxiety. So I was like, uh, I don't know. She's like, come on. She's like, let us hear. She was a um, big rap fan, big Biggie fan. Uh, I never forget. She would play him every Saturday. And I played my tape for her and she was like, oh, you got to get this out here. You got to get it to the public. It was like day one. I was like, the public? I was like, no. I was like, this is just, you know, something I do in my room in that little corner that I showed you guys prior. And um, we ended up going to, it's gone because it, it ended up leaving when I graduated, but we used to have a venue at on the campus called the Underground. Um, and so this is it. This is what it looked like. And she was like, you know, you got to go perform. This is circa 2010. And I was like, uh, I don't really have any music like recorded like that. Or I didn't have show versions of my music. So just for people that are unfamiliar for, for artists, um, you know, I'm not a live performer as far as like from a live band where I'm not always backed by a band. Sometimes I am for special, like for festivals and things, but for the most part, rappers go up with a DJ or, you know, what have you. And so you have to have show versions of your songs. So I didn't have any of that. I just was not prepared. If you see, I, I didn't even have Red Shades on. I really didn't even embody who Red Shades as a persona was. I was a shy little girl that just got on the Fitchburg State campus. Um, and this was it. So you're literally going to see me up there. This is one of my earliest um, performances as Red Shades. And I'm so happy to share this with you because this is this is Fishburg that I know. <laughs> that was a very special night for me. Um, I can't believe they got me to do it because I was like, you know, shitting bricks. But um, it was hearing that support from Fitchburg that early on, you know, 
people never know, like just the little comments and, and positive comments, like that can stay with somebody for years to come. These are moments that I hold dear to me. Um, so a little bit around this moment is when I was like, all right, so I'm Red Shades, I'm an artist. I gotta start like trying to embody who that person is. So on this photo on the right, you'll see I started wearing the red glasses because I wasn't, I remember the only time um, I was wearing the red glasses and being red shades was when my aunt bought me those glasses when I was younger. So that was like almost 10 years prior, right? One of my cousins from Florida stole those glasses from me and I didn't have a pair of red shades again until probably like 10 years later. So now I put the shades on and I, I took a photo shoot on the campus, I believe. If this isn't the Thompson building, this might be Percival, and if that's still there. And so I took you know, all these pictures around the campus, and I was like, all right, I'm an artist. I started trying to own that. And um, I'm not gonna show every video to its completion here, but I just wanted to show the fact, two things here, all these videos, if they weren't shot on campus, they include my roommates and my friends from Fitchburg State. Um, they were so supportive. And, and that's what this presentation is all about, is how my family and these friends who became my family are so supportive of my craft. They believed in me more than I believed in myself. I don't know what they saw, but I'm glad that they did. And I'm again, like I said, I'm forever grateful for the platform and for Fishburg being one of the first places where I was able to, to show and express that. Um, so this first video is called, It Ain't Hard to Tell. The It's kind of a little hard to hear, so I'm not gonna play the whole thing. Pay more attention to the, the locations because already in this um, still, those are what the townhouses used to look like back in 2010. I'm sure they don't look like that now, but my my roommates, my first roommates, which is Alita and Brianna, they're in this video all throughout. Um, and this is before I, I met like um, my other friends that you see from the picture. So I'm gonna show a little bit of that. I'm just gonna play it here from the presentation since I'm not playing the whole thing. Uh, and then we'll go to the others. Um. Take one. Let's see if y'all can hang with this one. It ain't hard. So what's the deal? Y'all know I pour my heart on these tracks. Ain't hard to tell. Y'all know Red is taking it back. It's only right. I want to change these people's mindsets and put them on the things that they may think is complex. I'm right here. So tell me what's the word? Who am I? I speak for... And then I'm fast forwarding. But yet we brag about our wealth and waste of money on chains. I had the nerve to get upset and look for someone to blame. What a mess. And though you live from check to check... You so as you can see, we shot pretty much the whole video. Some of those shots were actually in Macon, Georgia, when you see all the guys on the lawn, that's where I live down there um, on my grandparents' land. And then there is a shot from Rhode Island too. So I always would incorporate all my friends, all my family. I'd be like, oh, I'm shooting a video. I had this camcorder, which you could tell by the, the quality. And I would just put anybody in it. And people were always eager to be a part of what I was doing. So that was, it ain't hard to tell. Um, this video here was shot in Rhode Island and this just shows how my family like literally did whatever I asked. If I said, oh, I'm doing a video, could you be in it, please? Could you do this? Um, this video literally has not only my dad rapping, now mind you, this is like 20 years after his career. My mom raps in this song. My cousin um, does a little voice uh, in, the, in the middle everybody's my cousin in this whole still and I haven't been here. Nobody knows what's going on, what they're doing, but because they love me, they just went along with it and they supported me. This I'll put big. You really want to step to her, Shay? Mm. Sipping on that new low with a shot of you know okay. my style. Seven thirty. Yep. 
you pumped on, can't get them dirty. Why not? At the very least, stay quiet. Cause bitches be like, oh my God. When I ride by, I keep my eyes on them. They like to pop off. Don't do that wordplay. I let my gun say, nine to the M I double L E. Yes, that's my heater. It says beneath the seat of my bend with no lens. If you want a ticket there, that's where it ends. I never stop rocking mic shopping. I saw my wife. Get it right, little nigga. It's killing feel for life. The shades are now mill. Little shots to your grill. Do the time, do the crime. That's just how I feel. Never snitch, never will. My pride is too strong. Even my shell's not here. My soul will live on. That's it, and I'm gone. P.S. I stay fresh. Come out, to my wrong. I'm forced to go that. Red shades, I guess you up next. Grab the microphone and show how you flex. Let's go. It was a rap when I hopped on the track. Take it easy, little girl, fall back. Oh, it's mad, cause my flow's the nastiest. Y'all still remain hoes, I'm, I'm the classiest. Well, question, you should never be asking this. Who's, Who's the voice on the street that's, that's attacking this? Because the name of Shades, I go from here to break. No, I never play. Don't just say anything when I spit. Tend to cause corruption, and I'm hitting every angle. It is no discussion. And when I hit the scene, they be dodging, ducking. I can go on for days. Haters know it's nothing. If I just look in my eyes, you can get seductive. You can peek, you can try, but there ain't no time. So as you see, it was a family affair. Um, everybody loved to be in this in my videos, uh, and and I even got them all to rap. Just showing a little bit of this one. Um, this is keep it moving, moving. This was sort of when I started taking my career a, li a bit more seriously. I was in Fitchburg at the time. I think this was like my sophomore year. There's a bunch of cameos, again, from all my roommates and friends from the campus, my parents, again, just showing a little bit of that. Um when hard see me, I will never stop. Cause I never follow words. My flow is unorthodox. You may get your feelings hurt, but me, I'ma keep it real. I don't need to be a slut, just to have sex appeal. Maybe you right here is uh the bridge we used to have. I'm just someone that you can't keep up with. They ask me how I So that's that. And then um Give Me More was shot the whole time on the campus. We'll see some stills from that. Um LL Cool J and I only spit this one, so listen close to what I say. A lot of people think these might look familiar, so but people think I'm much older than my age Cause the knowledge I possess is many light years away From this current generation that we have here today Now wait, in my face, back it up, give me space Like make it hot, Missy E. Nicole Ray Wanna know who that JT money so late So not your lot, cause there is no competition Y'all stay in special lead, but me, I'm on a mission Don't mind me, cause I'm So, as you can see, Fishburg was the home to a lot of my creations um, you see around this video, my camera quality started getting a little better, but I still wasn't there yet. Uh, and so now it leads me to tell the story, um, of Fitchburg and what happened when I applied. So before I tell the story that's on the slide, um, and, and I'll wrap in a little bit, um, I applied to be in the film and video department. Unbeknownst to me, it was really hard to get into. When I got my acceptance letter, letter from Fitchburg, I was declined from the film and video program, but I was still invited to choose another major. I was heartbroken because all I wanted to do was to you know, build my skills and my expertise in film and video, and I wanted to learn more about that industry. So when I didn't get accepted, I was like, oh my goodness. But luckily my, you know, my ambition and my perseverance, like I rejection, even back then, although it may have hurt, um, it still didn't stop me from or refrain me from getting to what I want. At the end of the day, I'm gonna get what I want. It just might take me a little longer to get there and um, a couple of other doors and other people, but I'm gonna get there. So. When that happened, um, I ended up selecting the sociology major. Uh, all the while in the back of my head, I was like, I gotta figure out how to get into this program. I gotta figure out um, how to get into it. I am graduating um, as a comm major, that's happening. So luckily that did, uh, but it was a long, at the time, it just felt like forever. Um, so as I am a sociology major, and this was around my sophomore year, my friends turned into my roomies and then they later turned into my sister 
my sisters. And then I actually ended up uh, becoming engaged to the woman in the yellow shirt uh, two week, three weeks ago. And this is the woman that I met in the Hammond library that told me not to take McKay classes. We ended up finding each other again. And then she made me the godmother of her son. So it just shows you like the connections and the network that happens at the college. Uh, but on this particular day, uh, I everybody knew me as the quiet black girl that worked in DACA, uh, Chartwells, right? I wasn't really consistent with my music career. So these videos that I was showing you guys, these were off and on. Like one was from 2012, then 2013. I really didn't have um, a straight line where I was consistently doing music throughout those four years because my parents wanted me to focus on school. And we would, I did shows in between, but again, like I said, it was it was here and there. Um, on this particular day for our spring festival, we used to have like a, a celebrity or I don't know, a, a musician come uh, every spring semester. And so that year, Shout out to whoever booked Wiz Khalifa because you had to have been there to understand his influence at the time. He was one of the hottest things walking and he had just released uh, the Kush and OJ uh, mixtape. And all of us college kids, this was what we were banging then. It was fire. So when we found out he was the one coming to the school, we were all excited. And out of nowhere, my boss, Peter from Chartwells, goes, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're feeding Wiz Khalifa. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, that's cool. All right, dope. He's like, do you want to serve him? And I'm like, what, like get like backstage, like backstage passes or whatever. I've never done anything like that in my life. I think at the time that was like one of my first real concerts. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, can I bring my roommates though? I was like, this ain't gonna be fun if I can't go with my girls. He was like, how many? And I was like, just two. He was like, yep, I'll put you on the list. So, you know, shout out to Peter cause you're gonna hear about him again in the next slides. Um, he gave us the uniforms. We set everything up. We were so excited. You see us with the thumbs up in this in the green room that we made for Wiz Khalifa and he never showed up. Uh, he came to the concert, but he did not, um, eat there. I think they ended up going somewhere else. So we were like, oh, bummer. Uh, but we ended up being approached by, I don't know, security, it, you know, in the, uh, it was in the wreck. And they were like, oh, why are you guys here? Who said that you can be here? Like, I was like, no, we, you know, we're on the list, like whatever. And they were looking. And after about 10 minutes, you know, everything was cleared and they let us through and they were like, Sorry that he didn't come and eat the food, but we'll let you guys watch the whole concert from the side of the stage. He's going to enter through here. So we were like, oh my goodness, you know, and it was one of the best till this day, one of the best moments of my life. I'll never forget that memory. Again, I made so many life changing memories at the school and we ended up meeting the opener, which was Mims, which is right here. And he had a, a very popular single back then called This Is Why I'm Hot. So that was a super fun day. And that's when I became their roommates too. So going just a little bit into my career at Fitchburg, I wasn't really focused on the music per se. Um, I was focused, as you can see in 2013, I made it into the film department. So before I get into that, I gotta tell you, um, I mentioned Randy Howe at the beginning. He was the chairman of the department at the time. Uh, I went into the office and I asked the secretary, you know, how can I get into the film program? She said, I'm going to tell you, it's really hard to get in, um, especially since you're already in the school. Inter applicants, we only accept five per year. So your chances are slim to none. That's what she told me. So I was like, um, okay. I was like, so what do I have to do? You have to take these two prerequisite classes and you have to get a 2.5 or higher. I'm like, all right, put, put me in them. <laughs> so we get in there and, you know, I love the class. I forgot what the classes were called, um, but I loved them. And I ended up um, being classmates with someone by the name of, he goes by LTD Films and he now works for Viacom and for BT. And he shot uh, several of my 
professional videos that you'll see in the coming slides. So I was taking class one day, you know, I spoke to my professor who was Randy Howe and he was like, oh, you're trying to get into the program? He said, I'm the chairman, I'm the person that makes that decision. I guarantee you, you'll have no problems. I I'd love to accept you into the program. My heart dropped, I was so excited. Um, Randy Howe, again, thank you. Can somebody just let him know that I never forgot that? Tell him that Red Shades, uh, you he changed my life. And um, so you see me shooting movies here. We were able to use black, the black uh, magic cinema camera. Um, we even would make a couple of these videos for the sake of time. You know, I will, you know, send this PowerPoint to anybody that needs it. But these were, we shot in the Conlon building. We shot all over the place. And I spent a lot of 2013, as we call it, in the lab, editing using DaVinci. Uh, and I just learned so much. And I was able to collaborate with so many people there and, you know, based on my LinkedIn profile, I'm seeing that a lot of these, my same classmates are working at production companies and it's just so great to see. Um, so this is one of my favorite things to bring up. Uh, that same person that I mentioned, Peter from Holmes Dining Hall, he got wind that I did music. He didn't know at the time when he let us serve Wiz Khalifa. He found out that I did music probably because one of my coworkers might have told him. And he goes, I'm going to throw you a concert in, in DACA. I'm like, what? He's like, we're doing it. Um, all your friends, we're going to um, build a table. Uh, they're going to get served hors d'oeuvres. He had the DACA workers, the Chartwell's workers, serving my friends on silver platters. As you see in the corner, um, there's linen. He really turned this into a venue. You're going to see in the video, um, they made posters for me. He made, it was like, it was a Holmes dining hall affair because the host worked at Holmes. The, the performer, which is me worked at Holmes. Everybody knew they, how about the college did not know that red shades was me, the quiet black girl that worked in the dining hall. My, my friend at the time told me, I overheard somebody saying, yeah, Red Shades is uh, performing here this week. And somebody was like, hello, she goes to our school. We're in class with her. No, no, we're not. No, no, she's not. She doesn't go here. They're like, yes, she does. She works in the cafeteria. So that was so funny hearing it. And it also probably is why I separate the two because it's so funny that like now in Massachusetts, people tell me, oh my gosh, I didn't recognize you without the glasses. Like, it's kind of like funny being a superhero. You put on the cape and then you're this person and then you take it off and people act like, oh, you look so different, you know? So I want to show you guys uh, a little bit of that because this is all took place in DACA. And as you see on the right, I had a CD signing right after and like the support was real. So let's get into that. Films. Also, just want to interject. This is the same LTD films that I met in Randy House class. I, uh, you know what we did, bro? My girl Red Shade. She gonna be cool with little songs for you. You know, uh, right now, little. You see it on YouTube. Hundred sixty thousand views. So go on. And see, like, mixtape, and she's overheard overseas. Belgium got a radio radio play. Girl is banging. We're going to hear a little sign, and she's going to come out and perform for you. So let me get a noise. I can't even get a noise. That's right, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna fast forward a bit. Just gonna show you the CD signing part. I know the 
do this right for me To him I'm not his baby's mother, I'm his wife to be When we're alone it's not the only time he's nice to me He gives me space not in my face plus he respects my needs And I can tell it's genuine that he loves me so So I'ma try my best to keep him, never let him go See he ain't trying to be a pimp and I am not his hoe But if I do get out of line then he should let me know Yeah let me know When I see you I'm like that so as you see um the support was like crazy people were asking me to sign their cds they acting like they never saw me just yesterday when i was regular so it was that was a fun moment um and so then comes graduation uh i ended up like i told you i i said i was gonna graduate um from com media i did I'm grateful to the powers that be. And my first job, oddly enough, out of um, Fitchburg was not like anything at a film company. I did in have an internship at Hill Holiday, which is a marketing agency. But I ended up becoming a private flight attendant for the Boston Bruins. So during this period, I feel like is when I was becoming my own. I really was finding out who I was because all those moments up to then, I sort of was still moving off of values that were instilled in me from my family and my parents and, you know, just things that we heard around us. And so I was still very inconsistent with my music career. So we had some of these highs where I would do this, perform here, but I wasn't really consistent. So I spent a lot of this time really growing into myself. Um, I came to terms with, you know, sexuality with, um, with things that I didn't like, things that I do like, I just really came into my own. Um, and so I realized that I said, I've, at this point, I've been doing music for so long, so I needed a new approach um, to things. I needed more professional videos. I needed a brand. I needed brand consistency. So I turned things up a notch, like super big. So I had a huge brand makeover. Um, I got a new logo. My music videos were super professional, um, way bigger events. Um, and all my friends from Fitchburg became my street team. So you can see them in these pictures. We went out to Atlanta to this big hip hop festival that I got voted in to be one of, uh, on the bill. And that's my same roommate and my friend. Um, and they, you know, they walk around with me on their backs. People are asking them, who's here? Who's in town? This is an award show from New York. They always made time out of their lives to come support me. And just to show a difference in quality, um, I'm going to show you what this video looks like. I'm not going to play the whole thing so we can get into um, the Q&A, which I'm very excited for. But just to show you how we turn things up a notch. I'ma get straight to the point With a queen like me, ain't no need to beat around the bush See people make excuses now instead of making money A lot of people feel entitled just because of looks A lot of people like to follow, never be a leader Except me though, I can never follow by the book They say people gain impressions less than 10 seconds If that's the case, then I already got some people shook One honey, I can tell you have no substance, never prove me wrong All you think about is all the best that you can screw me on The hood mentality is probably the tip that you be on Doing good because you getting money and the roof is gone Predictable, heard it all before Need to find some different shit to do And no, I will not judge you for the music that you listen to It ain't even about that really So if if everybody is following here You'll notice that a lot of cameos in the video Are the same people that I've been showing you Through this entire presentation All these people in this picture were in the video um, The same girls that are right here They were in it um, We just turned things up a notch And this is when I remember on my social medias When people are like Oh, they were like, you're coming hard now. Like, okay. They were like, we're listening. Um, I fell under the radar for a long time. I was often overlooked. And, and unlike some of my peers that will blame it on the city that they're in and nobody supporting them, I knew what I had to do. I was inconsistent. I didn't really have the business acumen at that time. But during those years from 2014 to 2016, I did a lot of research. Um, and I started 
turning it up. So these are just showing pictures again. This is LTD film. Shout out to him. We were shooting a video for Vibin' and Coolin'. My whole Fitchburg family, we flew all the way down to meet my Georgia family that I referenced earlier. And we shot this video in Georgia and in Atlanta. These are all us. This is when we shot the Give Me More video. Um, and these are just showing some more pictures of that journey, like us filming it cold outside. This is us in Georgia. This is us at like some uh, Ricky Dink Club. I forgot which it, which one it was, but that's my roommate back there filling in for my hype woman that I had at the time. So, you know, these are just like fun moments that all made me who I was. And so now when they see who I am today, it's like they're just so dumbfounded because they can't believe like the moments we remember is everything that I showed you guys this whole time. So, you know, from 2019 on is when my popularity started to rise. This girl that was once or often overlooked and in her shell, I became a public figure in my community, not only because of the music that I did, but because of my community work that I do. I'm a youth mentor. I work closely with the youth. Um, I also give a lot of advice to other artists, my peers. When I found out the business side of music, I want to share that with everybody, which is why I found a music jumpstart. I just want to teach people how to be independent artists because no matter if you want to be signed to a label or you want to stay independent, either way, you need to know the business. So you might as well figure out how to jumpstart it. Um, so this is at my release party for my EP Chilling in the Shade at that time. This is when I started noticing a difference in my, uh, what you know, my, my, my following. Um, and also my leverage and my my impact. And that's, you know, a lot of people do music for different reasons, but for me, um, it was always about my social impact. And if somebody can say, I listened to one of your songs and it made me do this, that, and the third, that means the world to me. Um, a million YouTube views never meant anything to me. That doesn't matter because there's people that I know that have higher, you know, listen, you know, I don't know if it's called viewership and listenership, whatever you want to call it, but they have way more than me, but they don't have the same impact as me. And I'm completely okay with that because this is what I realized I wanted with my career. I just wanted to touch people by way. I realized I was talented in music. So I, that's my medium. But at the end of the day, I just like to educate um, and help and inspire. And uh, oddly enough, this person here is the same um, woman that you've been seeing in a lot of my videos. And she bought me a giving key that uh, says inspire on it. And I wear that to a lot of my shows just to remind myself, again, these are some of the same people that were in all the videos as well. And this is when things started getting bigger for me. You know, I brought all these people out. I gave everybody that attended my listening party a pair of red shades. It looked so dope in the pictures. I had people open up for me. I started doing festivals. Um, growing up, if you're from Boston or Massachusetts, you have to know who Pebbles is. She was on Jamma 94.5 all while I was growing up. So to be able to be interviewed by her, not once, but twice, this was so surreal for me. This is my, my DJ as well, DJ Troy Frost. That moment, it was like, oh my gosh. I was like, how do you go from listening to someone every day to they're interviewing you and they are a fan of your work? You can't tell me anything. And so that's why it's very important to maintain these relationships because had I not had that support from you know my family, uh, Fitchburg, my Fitchburg family, you know none of this would have been able to happen. I think the cards were already written. Um, and luckily enough, Pebbles uh, was on my latest album. You can hear her on The Last Interlude, um, The Red Line. And, you know, I started getting features on, you know, the newspapers. I was on, you know, Boston 25. I performed at the House of Blues. Now, uh, you know, when we put videos out, everybody's, you know, supporting it. And um, what really was great is that I got featured in NPR music. Hopefully everybody he has heard of NPR. It's a really big platform. And they featured me in there. And look at this picture, guys. This picture is 
all of my homies from Fitchburg. And so that's why my tweet says, this is the epitome of bringing your hitters with you. This is my squad of 10 plus years and my artist friends in this NPR music article about Boston's DIY culture and spaces. Um, I just love community. And that is what I found that I am nothing without the people. Red Shades would not be Red Shades without all these people that played a hand in making me into who I am today. I am forever grateful. I owe it all to everybody, all my teachers, um, all my advisors, my parents, and most importantly, Fitchburg State University. And I went on to throw workshops, uh, become a public speaker. Um, in my daytime job, uh, I'm an executive producer for a podcast show. So I'm actually exercising and using my degree, which is great. And, you know, this is where I'm at right now. I've been getting a lot of opportunities just based off everything that has happened in my past. And so I want to thank everybody for, you know, listening and watching my presentation. And this is how my family became my secret to success. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Red Shades. Let's, let's, let's give Red Shades a round of applause or snaps, however you wish to celebrate. Thank you. So we're gonna open up our Q&A set, um, section of the presentation. So getting started, do we have any um, one that would, um, that would like to unmute? And keep in mind that we also are taking questions through the chat box and through our Google Q&A form. All right, we have um, a question from Dr. Jewel. Hi. Hi. Thank you, that was great. Thank you. And so my students who, a lot of them are gonna be watching after, this is assigned homework. Um, <laughs> they, they submitted questions and the most common question that they had, so I'm speaking on their behalf, it was about, how you see the role of women in hip hop and like how you know do you think that their contributions have been overlooked or like how does the story of hip hop change when you take full account of women's contributions yeah i definitely think that uh it's downplayed and overlooked a lot that's why i like to watch a lot of documentaries because even more than just the wonderful um, femcs, that's what I like to call them, that we have had, even if you look at hip hop fashion, women are responsible for the looks that we all knew and came to love from Bad Boy, uh, you know, Death Row, all that. Like we had female identifying stylists, we had uh, journalists, like these journalists from Vibe and The Source Magazine, all this. They contributed in so many ways, but then obviously the most obvious being the femcs of MC like Queen Latifah, Little Kim, Foxy Brown, Lauren Hill, like just Lauren Hill's album alone, like it went diamond. Like you can't, that that's not something that you can deny. So we definitely have made our mark, but because it's such a male dominated industry, you know, that's gonna get overlooked depending on who you speak to. But I know in my heart, what they contributed. And even to this day, like I really look up to Queen Latifah because of how she transitioned from music into um, acting and then to executive producing. A lot of these shows that we watch, if you pay attention, her flavor unit production company is on it. And um, that is just something that I would love to transition into as well. And I feel like women contribute a lot behind the scenes. And if you don't research, you won't know. Any other questions from my attendees? Well, while we, um, while we continue on with the Q&A, I have a question. Okay. So just curious, um, are you a vocalist also? <laughs> no, you know, I wish. So, you know, I dibble and dabble. Like, I, um, a lot of, if you do listen to my music, I do have a lot of songs where I'm harmonizing, or I guess you can call it singing. Um, but obviously, I'm not nearly where I would like to be. So I'm going to say no, but I do have singing tracks, yes. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if someone was to ask you, who's your music for, or who's your target audience, what would be that response? I'd, I'd say my target audience are for people that are trying to reach their highest selves while maintaining uh, versatility, because oftentimes they try to pin you in a certain box and that's just not going to happen with me. So I think it's for people that, hey, today I'm feeling vulnerable. Today I'm feeling like, you know, talking mess. I, you know, I want to go out on the night on the town. Um, it's for the everyday modern person. Um that just likes transparency. Uh, that's what my music is about is, I, again, like I tell a lot of stories. So if you like storytelling, if you like intricacy, if you like um, things that'll make you look deep inside yourself, that's who it's for. Thank you. If you could return to your college years, what would you do different, if anything? Not a thing. Not at all. I think all of that needed to happen. I'm grateful for every situation, even the scary ones. <laughs> so I think that <laughs> that built character in me, um, I had to because Fitchburg State is where I found myself, honestly. So I wouldn't change a thing. We have a question from Mr. Wolfman. So Red, this was fantastic. Thank you for returning to uh, your roots as you sort of think about your journey and your sort of starting point in sociology. Was there a, a person or a defining moment in that portion of your academic career in sociology that you wanna give a shout out to? Absolutely, um, Professor G.L. Mazet Wallace. Um, I think a lot of the, I, I want to say, I, I don't know what you call it, but a lot of his sayings, I still hold true to this day. Like, so he would always teach us about, there's one lesson I never forgot. He said that if you didn't have um, three months of money's worth saved up, um, that you needed to go back. Yeah, you, you raise your head. I'm like, hmm, I'm like, he's right. He's like, you got to have at least three to six months of money saved up. And um, I forgot what he said to do that for, but it still applies to everything today. Like I can't leave any situation that I'm in if I can't support myself for the next six to 12 months. You know what I mean? So in sociology, he just put us, he put us on to a lot of people. Uh, crim I took criminology with him. He taught us about the weather report. So he's something that I would, someone that I would definitely want to shout out. Um, and I learned about cultural anthropology with him as well. Um, and so, yeah, I learned a lot from him that I applied to my everyday life. Thank you, Red. Um, we had a program earlier today um, and Dr. Joel actually was our um, co-facilitator for that program. And it's, the program um, was speaking to poetry mm -hmm. and hip hop and that connection um, and so forth. And Dr. Joel, please feel free to interject and correct me if I say anything wrong. But my question was, do you feel that you're, that you're a poet? Do, do you connect yourself to this, to the art form of poetry? I do. And because this is something you'll hear a lot of rappers say, but we often tend to start out with poetry first. Um, yes, I do believe they're very different um, mediums. And I, I don't think, you know, all rappers are poets and that poets are rappers. But me personally, yes, because I started doing poetry first. And that's how I was um, expressing myself, because at the time I didn't have access to buy beats. So I had to write a bunch of acapellas and these, I call it spoken word poetry. So that's what, when I showed you guys the video of my first performance at Fitchburg at the Underground, it was a spoken word piece because I would write free thought and I called them free verses. So even till this day at my concerts, um, I always throw in a section, whether at the beginning, middle or end, where I do an acapella and I call it a free verse and that's poetry to me, yes. Yes, thank you. 
Any other questions from my attendees? I had a question. Ah. Uh, Miss Marla, do you want to try that one more time? Is it Let's better see. now? Okay, I had the desktop one, so it was still kind of giving that feedback. Uh, my question was, if you had to select three people uh, that you feel heavily influenced your musical career, outside of family, because I know you said your dad was like a huge influence, but outside of family and like friends, the three people that you would say that kind of influenced the way you see your music or do your music? Yeah, definitely um, Nas uh, is someone that grew, he, as far as for his poetry, his, his his poetic approach to his raps and his storytelling and his vulnerability, for sure. Missy Elliott for her fearlessness and her creativity that she puts, um, I realized that um, I was more like influenced by Missy when it came to her songwriting. So I love her rap and I love it. the videos. They always captivated me, but I think a direct influence was how a lot of people forget that she sings as well, but more importantly, she's a songwriter. Um, a lot of people don't know that about me. So like a lot of the music that you hear, if, if a, a vocalist is on my track, chances are nine times out of 10, I wrote it because I write R and B music. I just don't sing. Like I'll try to do my little razzle dazzle, but like, I'm the one that I'm a, I'm an R&B songwriter. So Missy Elliott is the second person and then as far as independence um and seeing uh someone reach success from like independent their independent music career, I would say Nipsey Hussle um because before he was signed to a label and anything like that, um he got it out the mud. He started from the ground up. And so that's why I take so much pride in the success that I'm seeing right now is because it's super rewarding because I know that it was literally from the ground up, just blood, sweat, and tears from my family and I. So, yeah, thank you for that question. All right, Red, before we close out tonight, I... I could not do this with close out without at least asking. Would you want to give us a free verse or? Of course. Or, all right. Uh, you no, know, you caught me on a good day because usually I, I caught you on a good day. <laughs> usually I'd be shy, but yes. Um, but you have on those red shades. You got on the shades. So you see, you got okay. me. Because if right. I didn't have them on, you already know what type of time. Be like, absolutely not. I will not perform. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, here we go. Um, this is a piece called um, "Not the Victim." So, I'm not the one to play the victim. They gave me freedom of speech, but when I speak, it seems like the world never listens. And not to mention stressing about my ties with gender too. They told me not to speak my mind, but me, I like to bend the rules. Me, I'm often sexualized, afraid to wear the clothing lines that complement and show my size and often bring a load of guys drooling hard and so their eyes, they follow me, they open wide. First thought that comes to mind is disappear or go or hide. Why? I asked them, is that all I am to you? Every goal I crush is not enough. You think a man would do a better job? Swipe credit cards, flights, get in bars. That's all women do, at least to you. See, we don't get applause for nurturing. Feels we're working in. They feel our worth to men is non-existent. Hardly honor women with my skin is sickening. See, we're so different. At times it makes me feel like I'm, I'm not enough. Maybe it's my hips, the way they switch and compliment my strut. Maybe it's my confidence. I switch my do from month to month. When I raise my voice, they call it rude. For you, they call it blunt. They say my hair ain't right. My appearance might offend put fear in whites, but they don't care. My life's a struggle every day. I clear, I wipe the tears I shed. But my mama always saves me. She told me, go for what I want, but just make sure I don't get angry. A black woman mad is seen as foul, cruel, and crazy. And as a way to tame me, they pay me low and make me act in certain ways we don't identify and try to rectify like I'm a project that needs to be fixed. Like I'm just some machines or buttons you think you can click. I'm a whole human being and you see I exist. Maybe you'll recognize me more when I throw up the fist. I recognize I don't need the man or the world's approval. I'll just continue doing more. Well, you know, the usual. And I realize issues will go on 
and the hate will still offend you. But yes, I'm staying strong and I pray that it gets better. If I didn't teach y'all nothing, here is one thing to remember that yes, I am a woman, but I am not my gender. It's red shades. Holla. <laughs> And folks, that's red shades. I'm the new, I'm the new hype man for red shades. <laughs> that's red shades. Thank you so All much. Right. I wanna, I wanna thank everybody for putting this on. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of it. This is like full circle for me. You have no idea. Um, I'm, internally, I'm like going crazy. So I just want to thank everybody for attending and for reaching out to me. It was an honor. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, we'll have to do this live sometime. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Mr. Wolfman is the second hype man. You're, yeah. <laughs> oh, Mr. Wolfman, yeah. he, he knows everything, okay? <laughs> okay, he be, he be on it. So, yes, for sure. You got to I got to put you on a payroll. Yeah, your Lynchburg <laughs> crew just got just got a little older. We're just a little older, yes, you know that. But that don't mean that we're still not here. All yeah, right. Exactly. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Red Shades, for being with us this evening. This was fantastic. Um, and like Mr. Wolfman said, we have to have you on the campus. So yeah. I I look forward to you receiving that invitation, um, and for us to actually have you home on the Fishburne State University grounds, giving us a little bit of that free verse. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> thank you so, so much. <laughs> everyone um, attending with us, thank you so much for being a part of this experience. Um, and we have one more day within our Black History Month cultural celebration. But don't forget, Black History is 365. So see you tomorrow um, for our last day of programming, which will also include a taste of soul food. So make sure you stop by and, and try out a few things. So take, be safe um, and enjoy the rest of your evening.